Hello there, everyone. Welcome along again. If you've just joined us on WFS Live Day 2 of 5, uh, we're about to uh, embark into a journey of new monetization opportunities uh, in football. Uh, and uh, it is uh, in collaboration with Next Sports. As you can see, our speakers and our moderator are here ready for you. Uh, before we hand over uh, to Munir Zok uh, from Next Sports, um, just a, a little reminder once again. Imagine you're at a, a WFS Live event in person. You'll see the main auditorium, you'll come and see some of the content, you'll probably do some networking with some contacts, and you'll also, I am sure, check out the expo area. Out of curiosity, maybe you've got a set thing you want to check out, make sure you do. It's available here on this WFS platform, so have a look at the expo area when you get a couple of minutes or so. Um, now, as we've said time and time again, the hiatus in sport has allowed us to reassess things maybe challenge the status quo. We do things as we do them because we've always done them. Well, do you know what? Right now, in an industry like football, which is ripe for disruption, that simply doesn't wash, especially where monetization is concerned. Besides, the marketplace is more accessible. Um, tech is advancing rapidly as well. Consumer demands are changing. Uh, revenue streams are being fragmented as well, and um, all of which leads to new opportunities, even in times of, of crisis and complicated times like we've had at the moment. For football clubs, it could be moving away from those typical operating models, perhaps to something a little bit more digital, more agile, finding new ways to engage their fans. For rights holders in particular, it could be that digital transformation that COVID-19 has accelerated that has made them a little bit more nimble in the marketplace. So what are these new opportunities? How do we monetize them accordingly? So this session, as we mentioned, is brought to you in collaboration with Next Sports, with the following speakers. I'll introduce them all in turn. A Director of Strategic Development, Sales and Innovation Marketing at Lega Pro, Paolo Carito. We have the Principal at 3MS Consulting, Maeta Molango. A President of Football Delhi and Advisor for the Sport Next Education Institute, Dr. Shaji Prabhav Karan and moderating for us in this first session of the day, the CEO of Next Sports, Munir Zok. Munir, great to see you again. Please get us underway with this session. Thank you, David. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to our three uh, panelists. It's, uh, the topic today is around new monetization opportunities, new revenue streams, new business for the football uh, industry. Now, football organizations, as David said, they are branching out from their traditional operating model to explore new opportunities, right, to strengthen the core objectives of their um, organizations. Um, uh, right holders who have invested on their digital transformation strategy are finding novel ways to attract uh, new fans and to continue working with their partners and within their ecosystems. New organizations invested on innovation several years back are reaping the, the fruits today while several are left wondering what can we do and how can we cope with all of these new variables that are coming into our market, into our domain um, at a very rapid, uh, rapid uh, pace. Today we have with us three fantastic individuals uh, who will be shedding light on that. Maybe I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Shaji, all the way in, in India. Good afternoon to you. How do you do? Uh, good afternoon, Marius. Fantastic. Thank you for, for, for joining us. Dr. Shaji, we know that Indian and Asian football are still um, are still uh, developing right, their digitalization efforts. And we know that, that because of this, the margins are very, very, very big. Now, what, uh, can, can you sh sh share with us a couple of, of case studies that you have been following and you have been actively involved in um, in, in, in the Asian context? Uh, it's you know the Asia uh, is absolutely uh, what I think is you know uh, fabulous opportunities, big opportunities uh, in in uh, in, ev in every aspect of football and especially in India. You know it is 99% opportunity still there. You know whether it is digitization or the broadcasting or you know every aspect of football revenue. And uh, you know in Asia there is you know uh, different levels uh, whether we. You know, when we take Japan, Korea, uh, you know, they are into different levels and China is also uh, fast emerging as a big market and the potential as far as it goes, you know, if we go to Indonesia, you know, Vietnam uh, and, you know, Singapore, uh, Thailand, uh, these are uh, fast emerging markets and uh, 
and you know and especially uh, those stand countries where i worked uh, in one of the countries called tajikistan uh, where you know in 2015 we initiated a project uh, uh, to uh, start a tv uh, you know channel uh, first time uh, with the fifa funding uh, we initiated a football channel there and uh, that has uh, given them considerable revenue and today government is supporting them and uh, it has become an official uh, channel uh, the only channel for in sports there so therefore you know asia as a whole uh, has massive opportunities and uh, with uh, new uh, you know ai digitization uh, is going to be massive massive opportunities for world to uh, set its foot uh, very strongly and uh, come to india and there are massive opportunities fantastic we will we'll, we'll come to that dr shaji in, in a second maheta i will i'll turn over to you uh, calling in from from uh, mallorca you know as a current principal at 3ms consulting and as the uh, former ceo of a football club rcd mallorca um what 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 do you think are the opportunities ahead of right holders to monetize the digital content or even like the digital engagements that they are investing their money on today. Sure, good morning Munir and thank you very much for for having me on this panel. I mean clearly I think that the starting point is the fact that a lot of clubs have realized during the lockdown when there was no live game that there was a real need to stay relevant beyond what was happening at weekend, right? I mean obviously and this is just just corona is the fact that today is corona but tomorrow can be relegation. I mean in the end what do you do when the content of what you're offering to your people may be fans or sponsors is not at the level they expect and it can be just no games or it can be just a, a, a content which is not at the at the level they want and i think that's where to me there's a real opportunity around digital because it can certainly help you to stay relevant when there's nothing to show or not quality enough to show and for example i would applaud the initiative that for example ac milan uh, and leeds have, have launched in terms of teaming up with brock nation to try to build a story beyond what is happening at the weekend i think there's a need to not not only in kind of engage people but also involve them in something which goes beyond which is what is happening on on the pitch and 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 to add to that and to be more specific about one opportunity i would say i think digital is not just digital is what is all the information you obtain through this digital process no and i think in terms of being able for example to increase the amount of money that that fans spend at the stadium on match day I think there is a huge opportunity here in Europe. I mean, if you compare what fans spend on match day here in Europe as compared to what they do in the US, there's a huge gap. And to me, the starting point is, if I want them to spend more money, I need to know much more about them. And certainly digital allows you to know much better who they are, what preferences they have, how do they behave. And I think that Corona, I think it's good to think not just about tomorrow, but think about the day after tomorrow, because at some stage the fan will be back. And we're seeing the vaccine, we're seeing some change, and I think there's an opportunity now to say, okay, when they come back, what will be the experience? But most importantly, since those guys will be coming in in stages because they will not be able to come all together due to Corona or to Corona prevention, then they may spend more time at the stadium, you know, which means an opportunity to offer them something which is in line with what they want. So I think nowadays, as I said, staying relevant and understanding better who my fans are and who my sponsors are, I think it's, it's something that digital certainly can help us um, exploring in more detail and more successfully. Yeah, thank you, Mahara. I can definitely get, confirm that you know, through different projects that we have with, with our clients, we see that their spending and investment on, on digital has increased dramatically over the past months, specifically to fill a gap that no one had foreseen that it was, it was coming. Um, and I want to move to, to, to Paolo in, in Italy. Ciao, Paolo. Um, to you, Ciao. you are working you're working at Lega Pro. Uh, very few people know that Lega Pro is one of the biggest football leagues in, in, in the world, you know, with 60 clubs competing in three parallel uh, competitions taking place. And I know that the Lega Pro has been investing significant efforts to support its clubs with, on their digitalization strategy so that they can, um, as, as Mahara said, they can stay relevant when there are no games to be played so that they can know better who their fans are. Um, walk us through um, some of the uh, projects that you have been working on at uh, LEGO Pro, please. Uh, hi, Munir. Hi, uh, World Football Summit organization uh, for inviting me. 
uh, thank you for the question. Um, I arrived in Lega Pro from September 2019 and my first uh, action uh, in my business plan uh, was, uh, you know, to uh, agree uh, with a, an innovation partner that is next sport and together we started to uh, organize some webinar to push to involve in our uh, clubs the mentality uh, to start with the, the digitalization because uh, uh, we were just uh, uh, 15 days before the coronavirus so uh, we understand uh, uh, clearly that the, the crisis, uh, the economic crisis, uh, it should be arrived. Uh, so we started with organize uh, some webinar. Uh, we uh, organize some action like uh, an agreement with George Washington Uni University for better understand uh, um, how. Lega Pro, uh, it could be an hub, uh, an innovation hub for uh, for um, the clubs. Uh, it, it's been a, a very good uh, work together. Uh, we are satisfied for the for the, the job that we done because uh, uh, many clubs start with the. Uh, to catch uh, the data from the social media, they start uh, uh, very uh, to, to move uh, uh, some uh, CRM systems. So uh, I think that uh, 40, 45 clubs out 60 uh, are starting this process. And uh, I think that uh, that is a very uh, important uh, what we done uh, from just one year. Um, it's been a very difficult, difficult period, you know, because uh, um, uh, the possibility uh, don't to have physical contact with the, the marketing directors of the club, uh, 60 clubs to manage is very difficult. Uh, only in, by digital platform, but uh, I'm sure that uh, that we we begin a very profitable work uh, work for the clubs. Uh, in Italy, we are uh, living uh, um, a crisis period. But uh, I think that uh, is pushing our minds uh, to do better, to find uh, other uh, revenues possibility or to in we are uh, studying uh, how to increase our possibility. For example, uh, you know that we have a, a system that the media rights uh, from our first league, that is Serie A, uh, a, a little percentage of that uh, of that revenues uh, goes to the the other leagues, uh, so Lega B, Lega C, and uh, and um, uh, Lega D. Uh, so they are trying uh, to uh, open close um, to the Liga a media company with the involves of uh, hedge fund a little percentage of that of this uh, media company involved from uh, uh, hedge and uh, equity funds for uh, to open uh, strongly the market of media rights around the world and uh, they are considering the possibility to open uh, Liga H ch channel TV channel so uh, I, I think that uh, we got uh, the crisis that uh, uh, they take wrong everybody, but uh, I think that uh, it could be an opportunity uh, for uh, how the manager that works in this field, uh, because uh, um, uh, we have to find more opportunity. We have to find a new strategy uh, and for sure the digitalization can help us uh, 
to speak uh, uh, with uh, everybody around the world uh, easier. Thank you, Paolo. Th thank you so much. And Ma Maheta, I'm, I will come to you um, specifically on the on the hedge fund idea that Paolo was mentioning. But before that, we just have a poll coming in uh, with a question around um, whether uh, monetization in football has been held by COVID-19. 67% said yes, absolutely. Innovation in, in monetization is unprecedented. 33% of you said uh, we can't say yet. Uh, really, really deep inside this one. Um, Maheta, um, um, you know, uh, smart money is coming into European football. You know, we're talking about new monetization opportunities, new business models. Um, wh why, why do you think um, this, like, we've, we've been seeing a, like a rapid pace of smart, smart money making its way specifically into European football um, throughout this, this year? Why, why is that happening? It's, it's an interesting question, Munir. And, and the first caveat I would do is, I think I'd really make a difference between countries. I think the situation in each country is different depending on, on the model that, that each kind of clubs work on. Um, for example, France is a model which is based on trading players, which is very different from the model that we have in Spain, which is essentially based on, on TV rights income. But, but uh, to focus on Spain, which is the, the, the market that I know the most, what I would say is first, I think the, the valuation that you have in Spain or in Europe are much lower than what you have in the US to start with. Second, I think, whereas before it was, uh, it, it was a league of a lot of talent, but very little sophistication in terms of how it was ruled. This has changed dramatically over the last five, six years through financial fair play, which is very stringent. And second, through a stable long-term TV rights deal. And, um, and third, I think a lot of people start getting comfortable around the idea of relegation and promotion. I think that was one of the main source of concern, for, especially for US investors, which are more used to closed leagues. But I think now they understand that if you buy the right price in second division and you manage to go up, there is potentially a huge up upside to be made. So I think it's a combination of a model becoming much more serious, valuation level being more accessible than other countries or other continents like the US, and also the concept of upside, which is bigger. And I think in that framework, what you see is a situation where if you do things right, you end up at least turning a profit or even um, also being self-sustainable. I mean, you see, for example, now they're releasing all the figures in Spain. And despite COVID, the vast majority of clubs leaving, leaving aside three, four, five examples, the rest all turn a profit or break even despite COVID. So, so certainly it's an interesting time to, to look at opportunities in, in, in Spain in this case or in Europe. Uh, at the same time, I think the arrival of those type of investors is good because they're more sophisticated. They try to run the club more like a company than more like a hobby, which was one of the big problems we had here, which was more driven by you know, the passion, the fans and what they thought. I mean, here it's, it becomes more about making sure that this is sustainable. There is a long term plan and you don't just do crazy things just for the sake of winning games. Um, so this is changing. At the same time, I think there are some challenges as well, because I think this is not any type of investment. It's a special type of investment, and you cannot treat this as you do when you invest in, you know, in the in the construction business or in the retail business or in a hotel. So I think some of those investors also face the the difficulty of adapting to this very special environment, where in the end you depend on players which are human beings. You know, and the more you try to control the way they perform, it's you can control it to a certain extent, but it remains a human being business. No, um, so. So it requires this understanding of the local kind of um, specificities of, of, of the business and how it works. But definitely very interesting time, good opportunities, as long as you're able to understand exactly where are the good opportunities and how to tap into them. Yeah, the, the professionalization of uh, sports organizations in general, right, not, not just limited to football, is definitely... Uh, top of mind for for many many organizations. I think this has been helped a lot uh, by the uh, by, by all of the, the news that is coming out around like new investments coming in. There are lots of eyes currently on lots of uh, opportunities in the in, in in the continent, but also elsewhere. And that professionalization is is a big asset uh, is a big asset to have. I um, you, you mentioned TV rights as um, as one of the components uh, that uh, that leagues and organizations use to generate uh, value for the whole ecosystem. With this, I would like to move back to you, Dr. Shaji. Um, you know specifically uh, to tackle the uh, the broadcasting angle. Uh, in in, uh, in in India, what, what is what is the current broadcasting uh, landscape 
And what do you think are some of the opportunities that Indian football specifically can explore in the future? Uh, it's a good question, Manir. Uh, the interesting uh, fact uh, in India is uh, the broadcasting area is fully green. Uh, and we have, you know, 90% 90, 90 opportunities for new players to come in because right now uh, the broadcasting space uh, is, uh, you know, uh, not competitive uh, in India. And uh, the, I would say 90% uh, of the games are not televised and even not live streamed. And uh, we have, you know, 30 plus uh, states, uh, which are some of the states, you know, many of the states are bigger than European countries and the football, uh, you know, is gaining uh, very fast. Uh, but uh, still, you know, those local games are not there live. And even uh, the second division uh, at the top tier uh, league is not. And the money is also not coming uh, into the game from broadcasting area. So therefore, uh, there is huge, huge possibilities, and I, I am sure you know new players will uh, will be coming into Indian market because it's a huge opportunity uh, and uh, to grow this uh, uh, you know area, and uh, that's how the clubs will be sustainable in India. Right now, the broadcasting money is not coming to any of the clubs, unfortunately. And that's how uh, the big clubs uh, are in red. Uh, all of them are in red. Uh, you know, it is the range from you know 20 to 80 uh, percent. That is uh, that is a bit scary if you see. But then uh, the good part is uh, we are at uh, you know at a very infancy stage of our you know top level football. Mm, when we talk about professionalism structure, everything is you know we are trying to uh, come up right now. And that's where, you know, we can uh, really become, a, you know, play a great role. And uh, uh, we should target how we can become, you know, one of the top leagues in Asia uh, by 2030. Uh, that if we can, you know, work with and if we can get the right partner in and the new broadcasters uh, can come in and through, you know, digitization, uh, we can really crack this. And that would help, you know, the money to flow down from the top to the bottom of the pyramid, which is very essential. And that's how we would be able to do justice to 1.35 billion uh, population in India, because, you know, everybody keeps talking a uh, country uh, billion plus, uh, but, you know, unable to produce uh, that level of team, uh, which is, you know, uh, not in the World Cup uh, till date. Therefore, the, op the potential is there, but what we need to do is uh, we really need to engage with the uh, uh, you know uh, right uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, you know create an uh, enabling environment uh, where you know people uh, can come and invest into uh, Indian football ecosystem uh, and we all can grow together. Uh, that is what uh, you know will work eventually and i'm sure uh, this landscape is going to change and india become you know one of the fastest growing uh, you know football market uh, in asia yeah dr shaji you, you launched lots of lots of tra uh, trajectories lots of thoughts out there i'm i'm sure that your uh, your uh, uh, platform on the world football summit uh, uh, website will be uh, overwhelmed with, with, with messages. So watch, watch out for some messages coming your way. I'm sure there are lots of people yes. who are tuning in and will have fantastic ideas and probably come with, with ready-made projects that they can, that they can recommend to you. Uh, talking about the, the platform, we have a question coming in from Eduardo Cedran. Uh, Paolo, I, I might ask you to take this, this question because it relates to, to football clubs. Uh, the question is, uh, how do OTT platforms um, uh, perform, in your opinion, inside the monetization formula of a football club? Do, do you think that it's, it's one of the potential revenue streams that clubs can explore in the future? Of course, because, uh, because the, the, the way of consumers is changing uh, normally and during the time because you know uh, if you want to catch uh, the next generation so the generation zen and the millennials uh, you have to do uh, naturally in this in this way uh, because uh, uh, 
this kind of generation don't uh, uh, don't stay uh, sit on sofa uh, to watch uh, the, normally the television, but they prefer uh, to consume content in maximum one hour. So uh, the future will be, uh, of course, uh, to to see the match. Uh, uh, in OTT, because the new generation uh, by the device uh, concentrate uh, the TV, the laptop, uh, the PC and the mobile. So uh, for sure it is easier uh, to see the match by, uh, by OTT channel. Because you can see the match uh, wherever you are, uh, you can see the match with, uh, with, uh, with the subscription and, uh, and uh, is easy to go uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, and um, uh, now there are many, many, many platforms uh, worldwide. Uh, in OTT market, so uh, it's more simple for the for the right holder to sell the TV media rights uh, uh, around the world. So the worldwide the TV rights, because you can sell the the rights uh, uh, agree uh, with the only one broadcaster around around the world. Fantastic, Paolo. Fantastic. And with this with this, I'm, and I want to launch the three of you. Um, 10 years uh, in, into the future, okay? And I'm gonna ask you to be brief because we see the clock up here ticking. Let's imagine that we it's November 24, 2030. It will be a Sunday. Um, the World Football Summit is the most established uh, event in the, in the football industry. The three of us are here again. What will we be talking about? What does 2030 look like? In, let's start with you, Dr. Shaji, and then we'll move west from uh, from there, please very briefly. What 2030? What uh, will be? Uh, great, great. Uh, what I visualize is that uh, you know, starting from India, India will be huge. Uh, in, you know, uh, in world of football, top uh, ten in Asia. Our place will be uh, in the biggest leagues of uh, Europe. Definitely, Asia uh, will see a huge, huge you know influence on the global football. I am sure. You know, and globally, what I see is that you know we would uh, see you know a referees uh, uh, with you know complete automation mode uh, where uh, we won't see you know uh, assistant referees. Uh, they will be you know flagging uh, red and green. Uh, dip, you know, automatically, and there won't be any VAR, uh, and the referees uh, in the middle, you know, they they will be automatized uh, through AI. That what I see, and uh, the biggest thing we will have a superstar in women's football, uh, like Messi and Ronaldo. We will have a superstar in women's football, definitely, and India will have our biggest derby in the world. Uh, you know, not if not, uh, you know. Uh, uh, that is one I I predict now because we already have uh, one of the biggest derbies in Asia right now. And what I see is 10 years uh, we will have the, one of the biggest derbies. Uh, and what I want to see is you know absolute balance. And I don't want to see uh, clubs moving into a different direction and they form a, a world f body uh, to completely isolate themselves from the pyramid. Uh, which would be one of the you know uh, uh, tragedies of uh, football and that i don't want to see because of the growing tech and the money power in football uh, that is growing because the big big clubs are coming and together and concentrating themselves what i want is you know we keep strengthening our pyramid and and the you know and the money should come in and the last part i would uh, i would see that you know our players uh, will have like a stock exchange they will have a daily value, you know, not like, you know, their value will be determined on the day of their transfer, but there will be a, there will be a stock exchange on all the players and we will see that coming. And therefore, you know, there are, we will be in a better position, but there is one scare area that, you know, big clubs coming together and forming a new organization, completely isolating themselves from the pyramid, which I really don't want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaji. We'll definitely be on the lookout of the biggest derby in the world happening happening in India in 2030. 
Paolo, very briefly to you, uh, in 10 years from now, what, what will the football industry look like? Of course, we, we, we will be here uh, in 10 years, uh, in the same day to World F F Football Summit. And for sure, the, um, uh, I, I think that uh, in 10 years, more uh, formulas and more format uh, about uh, how our tournaments will change. Uh, because uh, we need uh, to um, to organize tournament more competitive. Uh, uh, probably we we will introduce. We needed to introduce uh, the playoff formula in all the European tournaments for sure. Uh, because we need to uh, insert new contents uh, uh, for the next generations and. Uh, and um, I, I, I think I think uh, many uh, we have to do uh, for uh, mix the new formats with new contents uh, in the future. Fantastic, Paolo. Thank you so much, Maheta. We will bring it home with you. Ten years from now, two thousand thirty. What 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 are you looking uh, forward to most? I can see David on the big screen, so I'll be, try to be to the point and 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 and. Don't David, worry, don't, don't worry, don't rush, much. don't rush. <laughs> My turn. Give us, give us the fitting finale we deserve in this panel, please. No, look. I, I mean, I, I don't know how, how this will look like in ten years, but but what I know, I think it's a good time to reflect. I think we're seeing that some of the audiences are going down. Uh, we're seeing that it's a time to reflect on not just short term but more long term, and 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 I think it's a good time to think that innovation is good and I'm a great believer in innovation and I'm a great believer in, in running a club like a company. But at the same time, this is a very special business. And, and I think it's very important to understand what were the key ingredients of this recipe, which has been so successful. What is it that, that we, we, we almost drop everything but the club that we like? And I think it's important to go back to those key ingredients, understand what they were and build on them, not just kind of trying to destroy the, 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 the golden recipe. You know? so, I hope that in 10 years we'll have capitalized on this liturgy about football, an anthem, an emotion, a color of, of, of a shirt, etc. And on top of that, build innovation to capitalize on that. So this is my word to finalize this, uh, this intervention. Fantastic, fantastic finale. Thank you, Mahera. Well, and also thank you, Dr. Shaji, and thank you, Paolo. Yeah, all, all the best to you gentlemen in your future endeavors. And uh, David, I think we're, we're, we're back to you. Thank you, Munir. Yeah, uh, listen, uh, just to pick up on what Maeta was saying there, um, it is a special industry, a special business. And I think, yes, uh, especially when you were talking about investors from overseas and we're seeing, uh, in fact, we've got a panel on this later this week on investors from the West really coming in, from the US, from stateside. They have to understand, but equally fans have to understand their approach and, and why they are taking this approach. And, you know, Maite, you and I have spoken about what you guys were doing at, at Este de Mallorca and how you were just trying to modernize. You were trying to innovate. The VIP experience, have, you know, saw that incredible footage of, of what you guys were doing there. And I think that it's equally the onus on the fan to try and understand football as it is right now in 2020 it's a business yes it's the entertainment business it's a you know it's a, it's a it's a company in itself football isn't just there solely for the sport it's more than that now and yeah, i think there needs to be understanding from from both sides but thank you for eliciting those examples and uh, yes also the the leeds ac milan rock nation partnership is a really intriguing one and i think you're right you know it goes beyond the 90 minutes on the pitch certainly fans are are, are evolving themselves aren't they sometimes they don't have the time to watch the 90 minutes on the pitch and they engage in other ways we got a sense of that from paolo as well digitalization facilitates communication and not only is that about reaching out to fans but as maeta also said understanding them understanding them through the data how can we best get to them how can we understand what they're doing on a match day what are their behaviors how does that help us both on match day and also in everything else that a club might provide indeed a league a federation i mean this goes all the way up the chain and from dr Sharji, if i was to use a, a football cliche here uh if you're talking about a player who wants to leave a club he issues a come and get me plea i felt that this was a big come and get me plea for india um and and it was fantastic for you to to tell us why to say that it's a green market particularly in broadcasting 90 percent of the games not televised such a big population and some really bold predictions and i think you know Munir's right we will be fascinated to see whether you do have the biggest derby in world football and who that superstar is in women's football, which of course is a, another part of the game, which is not just growing, but you know, it's really becoming really important in, in, in our lives 
journalists, for broadcasters, you know, for fans as well um, and, and people engaging with football. Um, guys, I think you provided a really, really compelling session. Thank you to you all. Thank you to Munir uh, for, uh, for chairing the conversation as well. Really, really do appreciate it. All right, we're making good progress. Day two of WFS Live and we're going to be back very shortly as we talk about video analysis. My goodness, this is such an important area, especially as you know, football clubs on the field of play, the teams trying to find those marginal gains, those vital differences that could be the difference between silverware and no silverware. Uh, that's uh, undergoing a bit of a revolution right now and up and down the football pyramid. And that is our next port of call here on day two of WFS Live.